Good afternoon, members and officers and any member of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting and welcome to this meeting of the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee. My name is Councillor Pippa Halings and I'm chairing this meeting. Um, for the information of members of the public, our committee advises Cabinet on the actions required to achieve the Council's targets on climate change and its environmental commitments. Can everyone in the Council Chamber please note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point and the camera follows the microphone being switched on. So councillors and officers are advised to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. And can those participating in the meeting via live stream, hello everybody, um, indicate that you wish to speak via chat column and please don't use the chat column for any other purposes. Make sure your device is fully charged or you can switch your microphone off unless you're invited to otherwise. Um, please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices so they don't interrupt proceedings. If you can, please use a headset when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And when you finish, please turn your microphone off immediately. Um, and we'll move straight to agenda item one, which are apologies. And yes, Patrick, Chair, we've hello. had apologies. Hello. hello. Yes. We've had uh, apologies from Councillor Grenville Chamberlain. Yes, and I have sent our um, best wishes for, for Grenville, who's, who's not well. So thank you very much for that. Um, any other apologies? I see that Martin Khan isn't with us, Councillor Martin Khan, yet, but I haven't received apologies from him. Um, agenda item two, declarations of interest. Patrick, do we have any members wishing to declare any interests? No. And then we go to minutes of the previous meeting. So if we look in our agenda pack at the minutes of the previous meeting. Do we have any comments? No, no. Okay, thank you very much. And so can I take by affirmation that we approved the minutes of the last meeting? Good, lovely, thank you very much. And we move then to um, agenda item four in terms of matters arising from the minutes, but I don't think there are any matters arising from the minutes there, Patrick. So we'll move to agenda item five. Um, and this is the North Stowe Enterprise Zone and Local Centre. Um, and we're going to have a presentation from AR Urbanism on the North Stowe Local Centre and Enterprise Zone site, which the Council bought in September 2020. And Kate Swan, the Project Development Officer, will introduce the representatives from AR Urbanism, who will then give us a presentation, which we are very interested to hear. So thank you, Kate. Thank you, Councillor Halings. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, this is a project we've been working um, closely with our client advisory team, headed up by AR Urbanism. Um, so we're really excited to share this presentation with you. Um, so I will move swiftly on and hand over to um, Ricardo Bobis, who's the, been the project uh, manager and lead for AR Urbanism um, in developing the master plan. Um, and he's supported today by Fred Labe from Expedition, who is um, a design en engineer and who's been helping Ricardo develop the master plan. Ricardo, can I hand over to you, please? Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Councillor. Can you hear me OK? Just double checking. OK, perfect. I'm going to share the screen if that's OK. And share the presentation. Um, it's going to be a double act, um, so I will cover the first part about the general information on the master plan, and then Fred uh, will help me to uh, complete the presentation, focusing a bit more on the blue strategy. Um, let me try to make sure this is okay. Yes, so I am covering probably um, some information you're already familiar with, but just for the sake of being all on the same page, I'll, I'll rather repeat a couple of information. I'll take the risk. Um, the area that the master plan for the employment zone at the local centre cover, covers is displayed in this image with the red boundary and is just adjacent to the um, bus, guided bus station to the north of North Stowe and effectively surrounded by 
early um, phases of the de of the development, the uh, residential areas to the south, the east, and the west. This is a close up of the area, just to remind us all what's there at the moment. It's a series of greenfield sites um, uh, on the site of a former um, golf course. Um, the area just to the south of the uh, bus um, station, bus stop, is um, used by the uh, park and ride uh, car park. There is also an expansion area which is currently just green, but it should is earmarked for additional parking should this be required in the future. And then the area in pale uh, purple is designated for the employment zone, while the uh, red um, or pink, I should say, to the south is um, dedicated to the local centre. Now, let me start by saying that this um, separation is a planning separation from a master planning point of view, we try to blur the boundary and making sure that we provide something that uh, two elements, but they, they, they're very integrated. So for instance, if we provide um, facilities within the local center, we would expect that this facility serve both the residential area to the south, the east and the west, but also potential uh, employees or uh, workers in the employment zone so that we have a synergies and it doesn't feel like this new quarter becomes its own living thing separated from everything around. But the same token, we also try to tap into the existing networks, both in terms of uh, pedestrian cycle uh, links, but also green uh, connection as far as possible. There is not a lot on the site in terms of, um, if you like, uh, elements to, um, to 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 re to record. I mean, there is an existing, recently established um, green um, uh, patch that runs across the the site, and a series of trees also along the B1050 on a running uh, on the west. For the rest, there are already established uh, potential connections that at the moment are not very used because there's no point of using them because there's, a, there's nothing there. But there are also there is also a formal or a recently formalized connection that connect the existing car park to Stealing Road and is clearly used beyond that with people um, running through uh, this patch of green and try to um, get into the residential area to the south. So in terms of the concept, as I said, they're not, they're not buildings there, they're not a lot of natural features to tap from, um, but um, what, what we try to do is try to build on the existing uh, green um, link that, um, as you can see on, on the screen here, and try to build around that a linear park that is meant to provide a, a, um, a connection that has ecological value, but also amenity values, as well as functional values. So for walking and cycling, connecting the um, car park, the park and ride to the uh, existing built um, green that's already been delivered, sorry, and also try to have a connection from the linear park northward towards a uh, retention pond that at the moment is just serving uh, as a runoff the uh, car park, um, which is probably not going to be um, accessible in the short term, but I think we want to enable connection there and try to anticipate the potential uh, later uh, opening and also try to formalize a bit better this existing connection that um, people are already using. Um, so we try to shape the master plan around this, if you like, um, structure. In terms of overall principles, as I said, we are um, creating a series of uh, development plots that uh, respect this, uh, this, this skeleton and allow also for a potential recycle center to the north. Now, I think it's interesting to say that um, the master plan is strong enough probably to take um, the, the, both the, the recycling centre and in case this um, doesn't happen, of course, uh, we, can, uh, we can have a master plan that is even, even stronger. 
Um, in terms of the decision on this, of course, it's not within um, uh, our <laughs> remit to take a, to take a, to make a call in that respect. But um, we are trying to secure maximum flexibility, so we have a design that works with or without the uh, the recycle center. In terms of the master plan itself, I make a big jump here before we look a bit closely into the public rail. We have a series of plots that are being, have been tested so that they can uh, maximize flexibility. So we assume, especially for the employment area, um, the possibility of having office uh, buildings, but also light industrial building or mid-tech building. The important for us was to ensure that we uh, secure a strong uh, public realm uh, approach to the public realm and maximize this flexibility within the plot. So in the future, when the council as secure partner is possible to provide different configuration without compromising these, uh, these layouts. As you can see to the north, we also took the uh, freedom of um, appropriating the expansion area of the car park. This is because we would really like to, well, first of all, we discussed this, of course, or had initial discussions with officers within the county council that are responsible for the, um, for the car park. We, um, we explore the possibility of, of using this because it looks like these may not be required by future um, levels of occupancy for the car parking. And then we suggested that if that's the case, it would be probably a good idea to use this car parking, at least initially at surface level, to cater for the whole um, area. Um, both the local center and, but especially the employment zone. This would allow to have effectively a um, zero car or near zero car um, employment zone. I mean, I say zero because it's still an employment zone that needs to be serviced. You need to have deliveries. You know, it's, it's an active, um, busy area, so it's virtually impossible to remove all. Um, parking from the area. But I think the bulk, especially of of cars that sit there for you know, eight hours or 10 hours can be can be removed and relocated the edges and that would allow us then to push the uh, alternative solution that relates to micro mobility. And I think there's probably a very good story in terms of um, connecting the uh, bus um, station with uh, electric bicycle, electric scooter or non-electric uh, devices as well and try to promote this, this connectivity. In terms of land uses, we're looking at employment space that you see in uh, uh, blue in the top part of these two diagrams. One is the uh, ground floor on the left and the upper floor on the right. We also locate a uh, community hub uh, to the north of the green that you see here at the mouth of the park. You, you see a little red dot in the middle of the, par the park in the northern part because we want to provide a sort of a um, stepping stone for those walking walking um, from the park and ride and break the distance, which is really five minutes, so it's not a long distance, but helping even further uh, breaking the perception of distance so we get more people to walk and also provide the wayfinding element um, and uh, guide people to towards the, um, the the local local center as well. Um, we also have um, food and beverage and leisure on the ground floor. And if possible, we'd like to see uh, residential units on top of this donut block that you see just next to the existing residential areas and to the east of the green. This is an early, early render of the site, how it could look. As you can see, we are locating a generous amount of space to park um, and the different areas of the park have different uh, meanings. Uh, we use as a model for this building, you see the residential building, some other developments in, in Cambridge, but of course, this is not architecture yet. We were just providing a, an early render to express the potential of the site and try to explain how it could look like some artist impression to express what we're looking to have. This is a community street. I'm sorry, I should have said it is. This road that you see here, a stealing road, uh, sandwiched between the green and the community center and this uh, new other block, at the moment is one of the two entry points into uh, Norstow from the north. We suggest to open 
the uh, connection to the further to the north, uh, which is probably better aligned to as a connection to the main centre of Norstow and if you like downgrade or upgrade for pedestrians uh, Stirling Road or the final stretch of Stirling Road to try to make this connection between the, the community hub and the green and the rest of development um, a bit better and easier for pedestrians. So we're trying to improve those um, connections. Now this street that you see here is exactly a view of Stirling Road downgraded with generous sods and a pedestrian priority, as I said. So deliveries and access to car parking would be provided, but uh, try to rule out the general traffic. This is a view of the park. Are we mentioning the park? This is a view of the uh, green with the residential block to the right and the community center with, I think the ballerinas down there, up there, um, <laughs> doing some activities. Um, this is the mouth of the park uh, from the north, from the residential area as you approach from the north. Again, and there are still impressions, so you know, take them with a pinch of salt, but we try to express an intention here in terms of design. In terms of green, what we've been uh, doing is um, try to distinguish different type of, of green, articulate. And by the way, um, we we working with landscape architect Okra, who are a well-established uh, Dutch uh, practice which uh, we have experience in uh, in the UK. The uh, uh, the linear park is of course the main uh, feature but there are a number of other interesting green areas so the buffer that runs all around the employment zone but also as we've seen before the community street where Stirling Road is at the moment as well as SADS on all the main streets and within the block that you see in pale pink here, of course, taking into account green roofs, rain gardens, and any other chance that we have to maximize biodiversity. This is a view of the emerging uh, master plan. And this is, uh, I'll start going through some aspects relating to the green. Uh, this is the linear part. What we see this is an opportunity to have this zigzag route which allows to break the monotony of the park into different if you like, rooms and try to maxi maximize it within each of these rooms the, uh, the potential in terms of um, biodiversity. As you move south towards the green, the chances to use uh, green areas for amenity and activity increases proportionally. But this middle section, if you like, is more to do with walking through and experiencing the site. I'm going to just go very quickly here. I don't want to bore you to death about uh, um, the different characters. Um, these are further um, examples uh, from precedent uh, images. As you can see, there are different also facilities around the, the route. We also try to give the frontage of the building towards the park so it gets activated and it feels safe and secure to use. And I'm going to end on to end over to um, Fred, if that's OK. And Fred, I'm going to drive the presentation for you when uh, when you're ready. <clears throat> OK, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fred Labbe from Expedition Engineering. We've been working with uh, Ricardo and Kate on our team in supporting the development of the master plan, uh, mainly from an engineering perspective, but also looking at the wider sustainability. Uh, so in terms of blue strategy, we, we have looked at the wider context and we are within the catchment of the Cottenham load, which we know has been experiencing severe flooding uh, and uh, flood alleviation schemes that have been put in place. So we 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 mindful on the need to control runoff on the site, uh, both in terms of quantity but also in terms of quality. And we've been working within the provisions already made within the master plan. Uh, as you probably know, there is a couple of large water bodies provided to the to the to the east of the, the wider master plan, the water parks which have capacity to deal with the runoff on the site. But what we have really trying to do within the master plan, as Ricardo was talking about, is really to bring the blue together with the green and the public realm. So really trying to come up with 
a holistic proposal to manage surface water runoff in the landscape, uh, enhancing biodiversity. So this is a section of the from the design code, uh, which we've taken as a as a starting point. But you can see there's actually very little going on in terms of uh, stormwater management. So what we have done, if you go to the next slide, Ricardo, we have looked at the different typologies of streets, different typologies of public space to bring those uh, such elements. So this is one of the primary streets with quite a general a generous width where we have introduced uh, sets and rain gardens on either side of the street to effectively collect the runoff, uh, control the, 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 the discharge, but also deal with diffuse urban pollution. You can also see the green roofs on the buildings, which will also play their part in the stormwater management. The next slide. That's another variant with a narrow street where we have the options to introduce more sets in between the car parking spaces. Next slide. And this is uh, one of the, this is the east-west uh, street where we have a, a wider green corridor and we have a pond. And with that pond, that also comes an opportunity to harvest rainwater. So we also aware of the, the, the water scarcity within the Cambridge area and we want to we've been looking at ways to to integrate the the, the stormwater management but also the wider water strategy so we want to look at closing the water loop and taking some of that water back into the buildings and for irrigation of the landscape so within that pond and within the network we're proposing to harvest rainwater to minimize the water footprint of the master plan. And the next slide, uh, this is just showing what would happen in some of the, the, the narrow streets uh, within, within, within the site. And I think if you go to the next slide, we probably, yeah, so this is another element. So effectively what, what this gives us is a, is a series of typologies of streets and how we've brought the suds into all of those all of those different typologies. Yeah, and this is through the through the main the main parkway. So here we have a more generous uh, search features integrated within the landscape where we can we can we can we can effectively retain and bring more water. So I think if you go to the next slide, we probably on to the biodiversity. Ricardo. Yeah, so the the other aspect that we've been uh, looking at is as well as managing water in a sustainable way, both in terms of flooding, control of pollution, but also, as I said, minimizing the footprint of the development and harvesting water, being water efficient. We've also looked at ways to enhance biodiversity. At present, the site is a green, a green field site, but uh, it was formerly agricultural, agricultural land and part of it was falling within a golf course. So the value, the ecological value of the site is relatively limited, but we have, we have aimed to achieve uh, the, 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 the biodiversity net gain target from the emerging Greater Cambridge uh, local plan which is really looking to achieve 20% biodiversity net gain. And we've done that through the, through the, green, the green infrastructure provision, integrating that with the water management, which bring a, a, a rich mix of habitats, but also looking at smaller intervention that we can bring onto the buildings with green roof and with uh, smaller habitats for insects and birds, as we have on those on those slides, so we think that with those the, the, that mix of measures, we can achieve the 20% uh, biodiversity net gain targets, subject to further refinement and subject to further surveys. But I think it looks it looks promising. Go to the next slide. Yeah, so we've also looked at uh, the the wider on the, if you want, the holistic 
sustainability strategy for the for, for the master plan. So looking beyond biodiversity and water management, but also looking at the route map to net zero carbon, looking at sustainable use of materials, and looking at uh, transport and mobility. And uh, we're really looking at an integrated approach, trying to find solutions that have multiple benefits and really trying to tie the different aspects of sustainable, sustainable development together. And the framework that we've proposed is to use uh, Kate Rayworth donut economics uh, principle overlapped with the 17 sustainable development goals from the United Nations. So Kate Wayworth Donut Economics effectively proposed that true prosperity and sustainable development really happen in that space between where the social uh, fundamental needs are met and between the, the ecological ceiling of what the planet can support. So it's really that space which creates the, 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 the gap for sustainable development and economic prosperity. So if we overlay onto that the 17 uh, goals for sustainable development from the United Nations, we get a, a very robust framework. If we go to the next slide, we have an example of a, of a framework, of a similar framework that we have developed for the Meridian Water Master Plan in North London. So Meridian Water is a 10,000 homes, 6,000 jobs, uh, master plan in Enfield in North London. So it's, it's a very large and complex development. Uh, we have we have used this approach and uh, we have developed this specific donut for, the, for that site. So we're proposing to use a similar framework for the employment zone and the local center of North Stone. I'll, co I'll come back to that. But before doing that, we've, we've looked at the, the, the policy context. <clears throat> and you're probably all familiar with that, the national policy landscape on sustainable development so if we look through the through the time frame we've got in 2019 the uk declared a climate emergency with a commitment to to be net zero carbon by 2050 the following year the government published the 10 point action plan and an energy white paper to effectively address how they are this going to be achieved with a, with a target to shift towards uh, green public transport uh, and uh, pushing for an electric future on more sustainable new buildings. This was then uh, captured also in Part L, a revision of Part L, which was uh, considered for, for, for consultation in 2021. And we expect to be launched this year, as well as the environmental bill, which will also set a number of those requirements into, 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 into policy. We also have looked at the, 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 the local policy context, the adopted local plan for South Cambridgeshire, but also the emerging uh, local plan from the Greater Cambridge Authority, which uh, provide a, a series of new targets. Next slide. And we've also looked at, uh, we were also aware that the, the, the Council declared a climate emergency and produced a, a zero carbon strategy to, to achieve the, those aspirations. And next slide. Uh, and lastly, if we go down the, the hierarchy from national to local policy, then we have the, the brief for the master plan, which also sets a series of ambitious uh, aspiration in terms of sustainable development uh, around landscape and green infrastructure, sustainable drainage provision, uh, net zero carbon, holistic approach with circular economy, water efficiency, climate resilience and future proofing, and interestingly as well, well being and biophilic design with consideration of the well standards. So we've looked at that whole policy background to effectively develop a vision on a set of objectives for the for the for, for the project. So if you go to the next slide, so this is our we talked about the donuts, the, the donut economics, and we I showed you the one that we developed for Median Water. 
and this is the is, is very sketchy as you can see it's in progress but this is the the emerging donuts that we're proposing to use as a framework for this project so we're proposing to have four sectors one is environment and resilience then we have carbon and resources health health and well-being and mobility and connectivity uh, what is important is to really think that all of those things are interconnected and work together to to drive towards uh, sustainable development if you go to the next slide we've taken the four the four themes and we've proposed a, a vision a vision statement for each of those aspects so we aim to create a biodiverse environment with climate resilience at its heart looking at flooding and also mitigating the impact of development we are aspiring we're aiming for net zero carbon development uh, threading lightly on the planet water resources as we said is a is a key aspect of that and then also considering and promoting circular economy mobility and connectivity we're looking at an accessible place which prioritize active travel and low carbon transport and then health and well-being uh, basically looking at a place where people can work and meet with the infrastructure for uh, comfortable healthy and meaningful lives i think it's very important to have all of those things together working together for example if you if you look at uh, carbon mitigation that really needs to be balanced with uh, health and well-being you might look at reducing carbon uh, in buildings which might push for a particular type of glazing a particular type of uh, approach to controlling solar gains but that needs to be balanced against daylight this is just an example but all of those things needs to work really nicely together and then to finish we have turned those vision statements into a series of objectives for each of the themes and if you go back if you visualize the the donuts that we're trying to build this is effectively going back to a different little piece of the donuts which will then uh, create the different uh, objectives of the of the project so we've talked about most of that i probably don't need to run so each of them individually but this is this is the aspiration of the of the project thank you very much just uh, just a closing re remark for me and thank you fred um so what we're really aspiring to do this is concept design um probably worth noticing, but I think we were very keen to establish a strong approach to um, to sustainability from the outset uh, in the hope, of course, that the next stages of design will uh, um, take this to the, to the next level. Uh, Nostal is a healthy new town as well, so there is strong ethos in terms of um, um, making sure that these benefits are also uh, relating and relevant to the people that are using and living this, uh, this, this, this development. And again, we we'll really try to establish a very, uh, an exemplary development of a uh, business uh, quarter and local center that is not something, um, you know, parachuted out of out of space or being out of town. This needs to be really a new generation of, of uh, if you like, um, employment zone. I think, Kate, I'm going to give it back to you if you want to add anything. Thank you, for Ricardo and um, Fred. Um, yeah, so I hope that was um, really interesting for um, everybody today. Um, I don't think I'll say too much more. I'll just um, hand back over to Councillor Hayling um, and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much. I find it hugely interesting and, and really good to know that as the council being part of this is engaged from the very, very beginning in making sure that this is completely embedded with all of the policies that we have. So I'll take some questions first. I see councillor, but also I realised we didn't introduce ourselves. So anyway, as you speak, you can introduce yourself. Councillor Bridget Smith, leader of the council and cabinet member for climate change. Oh, thank you very much. So that's the second uh, cabinet mm. had this presentation and actually there's so much there that I probably need a third you know, need to go through it a third time actually um, so I mean I find it really really exciting actually and I think the uh, the visuals are great 
um, you know, it's, uh, it really sort of brings it to life. Um, since we started talking, so we talked specifically about biodiversity net gain. So it's something that we've been talking about, or I've been talking about for four years now. And there's a, there's a sea change happening in how people view it. Um, from the, something that's just been definitely in the too difficult pile to something that people are now really seeing as an opportunity and embracing. So in very, very recently, in the last few months, I've started sitting in presentations where people start talking about 20% gain as a minimum rather than as a target. Is that something, is that a position we're going to get to with North Snow, realistically, in your view, please? Uh, maybe I, I, I will answer that. I think what we have done for Nosto, so we, I'll be, I'll be very honest and clear, we, we, we're missing some uh, current surveys. So we, we, have some, we have some information on the site at the moment, but we don't have recent uh, complete ecological surveys. But we've used the information we have. We've used the, the history of the site. Uh, we've used site visits and the information in the... In the in the master plan, and we've looked at, so that this is to effectively get the baseline, and then we've looked at the, the palette of intervention that we've, 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 we've proposed, both large and small, and we found that we can, we should be able to achieve 20% uh, without, without pushing the, we, 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 without, without too much effort. So I think we could potentially go, I think, a little bit above 20 percent, but it, it does depend on what's currently on the site. So if we have a, a particular ecological habitat that we don't know about, that, that could potentially change those calculations. So I think at the moment we hope that yeah, we, can, we can achieve 20 percent, but it depends on the baseline. Ensuring. Um, I think, you know, we are now um, well, well informed enough to accept that delivering on site in a lot of cases is actually just not, not possible. So I think we are far more um, accepting of the fact that if we're going to hit these ambitious targets, there has to be some off site offsetting. I'm looking to Councillor Haitlings, who's the expert on this, in order to do, to do it. And I think as a council, we are receptive to that in order, you know, because that's how we de deliver the maximum benefit. But it's, um, it's interesting to hear that your initial analysis shows that there is quite significant opportunity within the site as it stands at the moment. But I wouldn't like to think that you stopped at that, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, you looked at other opportunities as, as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, Councillor Paul Bergmark. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Paul Bergmark. I'm a um, member for um, representing uh, Milton and Water Beach Ward. Um, just a, a couple of points. Um, I was really pleased to see the donut economics framework in there. That's one of my favourite uh, frameworks mm. for uh, balancing um, different competing um, influences. Um, I appreciate this is a master plan, but a couple of um, kind of ideas on this. Um, I noticed that the, um, the it was looking at kind of suggested 10% on-site uh, energy generation, and that seems quite low. I, I wondered whether there was an opportunity for uh, solar generation at the uh, busway car park in the same way as happening at St. Ives. So placing solar panels above the car parking spaces um, could be a, an opportunity for generating on-site um, energy. Um, the other thought is businesses uh, require a lot of um, courier deliveries and pickups throughout the day. And I've noticed in a lot of places there isn't provision for the vehicles to um, pull up and make their delivery. Often they're parking on pavements or they're parking on WLA lines. Um, and I wondered whether there was an opportunity here for a kind of courier hub, hub um, where um, the last kind of 100 yards or so could be cargo bike deliveries. 
um, so that all the all the courier deliveries in the vans come to a central point, and then the last the last couple of hundred yards is is um, cargo bikes. Um, just a couple of thoughts on 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 that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take another question. I think Councillor Graham Cohn. Um, just a, a I quick. To introduce yourself. I'm really sorry. Sorry, uh, my me. bad. Yeah. Um, no, my so, bad. <laughs> um, so uh, my name's uh, Councillor Graham Cohn, and I'm from the uh, Fenditton and Fullbourne ward. Um, so uh, my question was around um, uh, sort of bird boxes, swift boxes, the insect um, bricks that are um, in these. Uh, commercial buildings, uh, really just to ask, um, have you looked at where these um, have been already implemented on other commercial sites? I know across South Cambridgeshire we've got them in residential areas, um, but because of the, the different species and things, I, I know I, I've sat in talks where they've talked about heights of those bird boxes and where they should be situated on, on sort of new development. So, uh, just, just to ask about that. And, and the second point was very similar to the point that's already been raised about generating energy at, at source or on site, whether that be through um, uh, solar panels, but, but also um, using the, the water that is um, uh, runoff water on, on site. So whether that's for industrial use or um, flushing toilets or whatever it might be, is there any means to use that um, runoff that you're, um, you know, very eloquently capturing across that site um, at source? Cheers. Um, and we'll, yeah. yes, and Councillor Jeff Harvey as well. If you're noted down the, the questions here, thank you. Um, well, firstly, uh, uh, and you're from. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yes, Councillor Jeff Harvey. So, I'm uh, one of the two vice chairs for, and also member for Borsham Ward. Um, I, I want to just say, I thought this is really inspiring because some, quite often you see um, uh, visualizations of a, a new developer, a new kind of deal that um, just as a last minute thing, a few trees have been randomly plonked down to make it look green. But I, I just have the reassuring feeling here that um, this whole, um, biodiversity theme had been sort of very much part of the, the sort of early concept and, and really sort of built into it. And I, I also thought, well, it's, it's so nice to see that um, we can provide, hopefully, a, a, a really um, a sense of well-being in a working environment um, for just ordinary people to enjoy, not, not people who work in sort of, you know, high-value industries where you, know, you have sort of atriums with running water and so forth. This could be just as good. Um, I, I wondered um, actually how it would sound in terms of, because um, one thing you can't see from these visualizations is sort of soundscape. And I just wondered if any thought had been given to that. I mean, you've got a few elements there, like the sort of um, walking boards and um, maybe the trees, I suppose the rustling of the trees and some of the, the wildlife. It'd be interesting to know how you sort of conceptualize that. And also just a final thing, um, what would be the embedded carbon? Um, and have we thought about using uh, some wood in construction, um, or, or would it be uh, predominantly concrete? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We, we're just a bit tight on time, so if you can just sort of, yeah, be a bit precise on those responses. Thank you. Okay. Should I take the first question about the, the renewables? Yes, please. Uh, the 10% the renewables is from the, the project brief, which is uh, 2020, dated 2020. Uh, in our strategy, in our sustainability strategy, we have reviewed the local policy requirements. And I think there is a, a requirement from the Greater Cambridge Emerging Local Plan, which asks for all operational energy to be coming from re renewable sources. So this is what we this is what we like to, to have an, as an aspiration, so much beyond 10%. Uh, and uh, yes, I think the idea of uh, having some photovoltaic panels on some of the car park uh, could also be could also be very, uh, could, could contribute to that strategy. So I think we could have roof-mounted PV working well with green roofs, but also use the space on the car park 
to get to get some uh, renewables. Just to jump in there, Fred. Sorry, just to add, um, the car park, so the, the car park for the park and ride, isn't isn't in our ownership. So it's definitely um, there's an option there to explore sort of a local energy generation and distribution um, project with you know working with the county with solar panels. But we don't actually have kind of the ownership or the um, yeah the control over that site. But it, it is something we will explore. Can I give a flash answer about the um, logistics? And I really, really agree with the uh, idea of a neighborhood consolidation center and the last mile to be operated either with electric vehicles or uh, or bikes. I think it's it's brilliant. And I think if we're going to make a recommendation, of course, it will depend on the delivery route and uh, who will manage the, the area to really harness the, the most of it because the last thing we want is to put in place and then everybody going in different direction not using it so we will have to have a coordinated approach which is easier when there is a, a um, an overall management of that for bird boxes we haven't taken a look in terms of height and all of that because it was still a concept level we make a recommendation and um, I didn't hear the point about construction techniques because my connection dropped. So apologies for that. It was okay. whether how much, how much embodied carbon. So how much is looking at using oh. wood rather than um, cement or concrete? OK. Yes. Yeah, so we have we have done it's not in those slides, but we have done uh, if you want a route map to zero carbon. So we've looked at all aspects of uh, carbon, operational carbon, embodied carbon. Uh, we have looked at minimizing the embodied carbon of the buildings to to the Letty Letty guidance and to the Riba 2030 guidance. And I think this effectively pushes towards uh, sustainable construction and potentially timber construction. So the, I think we, we 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 set up some quite ambitious targets on embodied carbon as well. There was a question on water efficiency as well. So I think we. We we have set up an approach to to minimize water demand at source. So really looking at all ways of being water efficient within those buildings, from from fittings to user behavior to metering and leakage control. And then we have this opportunity also to harvest rainwater from the stormwater system, which effectively could be fed back into into the buildings uh, to flush toilets and to displace. Uh, potable water demand. And I think on the sound, I like I like the question about how does this place sound. Uh, we, at, we don't have an answer to that yet, but we we have looked as well at the the feel of the place and the health and well-being and trying to create uh, a range of different place, active place or quieter place. And really looking at the shading and the, the the health and well-being within buildings and outside of buildings. Lovely, thank you very much. And then um, I have a couple of um, questions, but also comments that I'd like to do. So um, you were talking about this being a zero carbon or near zero carbon free area. When you showed us all of the um, slides there you were showing cars on every street. So I was just wondering how that matches up. So that's sort of a, of <laughs> a quick one. If you could answer that, and then I just have a couple of kind of comments I'd like to make. It, it's, it's very, very quick, the, the answer in the sense that we provided those sort of drop off points throughout the development. So we wanted to demonstrate that you can get access to the buildings in front of the doors because that, that's going to happen anyway. Um, but yes, and then and, uh, try to uh, remove the the cars from the equation. So we also need to provide for blue badge holders, you know, and and um, disabled car parking. So we maintain that. We move everything else off. We use micro mobility to manage that. And although we do realize that we also rely on land that we don't own for the expansion zone of the car park, we think it's possible, but we leave it there. In case that is not achievable, we still have tested the master plan. It can hold and uh, within the block. Uh, the parking inside without eroding the quality of the public space outside that you've seen. That's the fallback plan. Yeah. And pavements, I suppose. So it was very good that you do show that you can drop off. There's a space for it without. Um, but those are not. Those yes. are not 
parking spaces. That's what we're understanding. No, the yeah. drop-off points. Yeah. yeah, the drop-off points. So I'm, and I'm learning. So I've got neighborhood consolidation. Was it neighborhood consolidation center? And center. Ability on that one. So that's very, very interesting about where you bring in all of the deliveries and perhaps then go out in terms of micro yes. That's very good. So can I just sort of, in, in conclusion, we're sort of noting this, we're, and I think all of the comments that I've heard um, are very, very interested in the kind of example this gives. It's, you know, seeing that the council leading on this, because being the owner and then working together with the developer, what I've heard from you so strongly is you are actually giving us clear examples of what's being tried to being achieved by our emerging local plan and you're being guided by that and that is just fantastic because you know your diagrams are showing us what new development can be like you know if, if we actually take all of this on board and make it serious um, what I do have so I would like to do when you're looking at your policy context can we add a couple of serious um, important documents so one would be you've got the zero carbon strategy of our local development, our local council zero carbon strategy. The sister document is the doubling nature strategy. I think you're okay. already taking a lot of that on board, but it would be good to have that there. But also the recently adopted biodiversity um, supplementary planning document. So if you could just bring those two in so that you can acknowledge them. Everything that you're saying is absolutely in line with those, but I think yeah. it's very, very good to have them acknowledged. Um, and the blue green water, um, I've been very interested in, um, in, well, there's a concept called nature smart cities as well, and how we're doing that blue green adaptation. And what I'm just so happy to hear today, as you were showing the first slides, you know, and reading the documents thinking, well, you have the suds, is there any way of also recycling, as Councillor Cohn was asking, you know, recycling that and taking it round, and you're already thinking about both the flooding and the water scarcity, and then linking that into the green, which it's just so good and motivating and enlightening to hear of you know, developers talking in that way. So thank you at this concept stage. I would wonder about the semi-permeable um, pavings um, and whether that is something when we talk about greening, that it doesn't all have to be tarmac, even where we're, we're driving and delivering. Now some of that, because it's an enterprise zone, We'll need heavier vehicles, perhaps, but I think if we can consider where the semi-permeable paving, um, as well as the suds, could could help. I like mm -hmm. the idea as well of that sort of the link, you know, that that um, between the busway and um, the local centre that you have a halfway place. You know, making something of that that sounds very good. In terms of donut economics, and I share um, Councillor Paul Bear Park's, um, you know. What do you say? It was one of your favourite preference for the for the donut economic model, and 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 me too. And I've done quite a few now examples of how you adapt this to a local situation. So the mm -hmm. only thing I would like to come to propose is yeah. that when you do the the local example, is you've gone from the donut economic, which is our ecological boundaries on the outside, and we don't want to overshoot, and in the middle is where we get the social fall through of people who fall through the net or some of those rights and social needs and economic needs fall through the middle and that's why i would like you to continue to keep rather than dividing up into four you keep the outer rim and the inner rim around the ecological and the social what that would allow us to do i didn't hear it would do exactly what you said which is a business quarter and a local center that doesn't sit on the edge so what you do on this in the in the inner part would be to talk about economics as well. You're bringing economic development jobs and possibilities and alternatives into a local area. So that's local economic development, which you haven't talked about in your donor, which I think is huge. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and access to that as well, and linking it through maybe with some of the educational opportunities in terms of skills. So I think if you brought that into your centre, and then we go to your outer. Where you have all of the um, and the health and well-being would be in your middle in your center obviously part no. and then no. your ecological i just didn't see i'd like to see what you did talk about which is water scarcity you talk about the flooding for resilience and i think your water scarcity you've done quite a lot around that so i'd like to see that emphasized within your mm -hmm. donut and then finally um waste so, we, you know, how you bring in waste management in, in that enterprise zone as well, I think would be, 
would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're look, yeah, we're thank really, you. really thank looking you. forward to seeing how this moves forward. It's a thank huge you. example. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Members, um, what an inspiring way to start. We go to agenda item six and another one, which is the Cambridge Solar Together update. Um, and this is the recently completed Solar Together Cambridge scheme. And Eleanor Haynes, Climate and Environment Project Officer. Eleanor, are you with us? Hello. Hi, Ellie. We'll present Hi. this report. Uh, um, thank you, Councillor Halings, and uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, I'll just, I've just got a slide to share. Um, that. Can you, can you see? Oh, no. Sorry. Can you see that all right, or is it still on the... We can, no, it's now on presentation. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm just going to provide a short update on the Solar Together uh, Cambridge scheme. Um, so the scheme is, um, as you all will know, a, gro a group buying scheme for solar panels and battery storage uh, led by the Cambridge County Council um, in partnership with the company iChooser. Uh, so the scheme helps to deliver the council's zero carbon strategy uh, by increasing local generation of electricity and reducing reliance on grid electricity. Um, and it also benefits residents, local businesses and community groups. So residents can uh, register their interest um, and these registration numbers are taken to a group auction um, where the company offering the lowest installation price wins the contract. Um, residents then receive an offer for the scheme um, and can choose to accept or reject the offer. So in South Cambridgeshire, 605 households accepted the offer. 182 dropped out following the survey, um, but this number of dropouts from the scheme is to be expected. Uh, the number of installations uh, was therefore 416. Um, and this meant that 5,743 panels were installed. Um, and this ultimately resulted in a reduction of uh, 386,637 kilograms of CO2. Um, there are also 32 battery installations, um, and this means that the, these households will really benefit from the storage of electricity um, produced on their own houses so that they're directly benefiting from the panels um, and are not as reliant on grid electricity. Um, and so South Cambridgeshire uh, District Council also received a commission of the sales um, of the solar panels based on the number of installations. Um, and this was higher than expected. So the council's net income from the scheme was £10,610.77. The scheme for this year has launched um, and the deadline uh, for residents to apply is the 16th of March. Uh, after which residents can still apply, but it won't count towards the numbers uh, which are sent to um, the auction. Um, and so, so it'll, it'll seem fewer after this date. Um, and so, so far there's been uh, 1,035 households in South Cambridgeshire, uh, which have already registered their interest, um, so, which is a really uh, positive start. And we hope that more, more will continue to apply. Thanks. Can you put the slide up again there? Oh, That's yes, of course. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. And can I ask a question there? Yes. Which would be, um, what's the percentage? What was the percentage of registration compared to the amount of uptake? Do you know that? Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so it was um, so 2,466, I think, registered. Uh, that's off memory, um, but I can confirm that with you um, in an email. Um, and then so uh, then 605 um, accepted the offer. Good, and, so, and that's an interesting, so I think these, these figures are just amazing because I think we did have one of the highest registration rates, didn't we? And that we did a lot of um, promotion of this and we got a, the highest interest, um, level of interest. And then 
there would have been a certain amount that actually then said, yes, come and do an assessment and paid the deposit for the assessment. And then, which I think was 150 pounds, and then they got the assessment and then you decide, is it worth it? Am I going to do it? So do you have any sense of, um, is that a good, you know, rate of acceptance to an early um, sort of registering of interest? Uh, in, so, so the the registration in comparison to the actual um, acceptance, um, I'm yeah. I'm not quite sure if that's um, if that's the norm compared to sort of schemes in other areas. Um, I would have to contact iChooser to get that information, but I would say that it's a pretty good um, acceptance rate, um, especially um, yeah, given uh, yeah, given that. Uh, there was sort of like the uncertainty of the energy market as well at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think and what, so, and what I'm talking about is one of the reasons that we decided to really link up with this scheme and when we were looking as, as a council and, um, you know, as the committee, how do we, what role can we play to encourage people to, um, you know, have great energy generation in their own homes? Um, it was in the end that councils are trusted brokers so since the feed-in tariff is gone and now some of the prices have gone down but what we were being told by tenants and residents was it's just kind of a it's it's so complex to navigate and we don't know who's a trusted provider and who will continue out there and give maintenance so if you invest and then you find that these cold callers go bust so you know that's how having a trusted broker through the council to a trusted provider and then being part of a joint cooperative bid to get a better price for your smart export guarantee is would seem to be you know what we were that's what we were thinking this is the best role we can play so it'd be really interesting to know one we've got high interest level in terms of signing up for at least for registration and it really would be good to know is that kind of is that a good uptake and if so we can compare it with this year and then know whether there's anything else we need to do to improve that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've got Councillor Graham Cohn and then Councillor Bridget Smith. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, so I should probably declare interest and I've applied for the scheme. Um, and uh, so I've got solar panels on my um, uh, ex-council house, um, but I quite like the battery pack because I work all day and um, most of my energy is used in the evenings when the, the sun isn't shining. So um, I'd speak, been speaking to, to residents about the scheme and I think, I think personally the uptake is very good. I think it's been set out in a sort of clear way. I know there's been lots of uh, correspondence from uh, it, like in, in letters, on social media, emails and that. So I think, I think that side of it has been very good and, and I think the uptake is good in my opinion um, what I was going to ask about is that um, when I spoke to some residents about this they they talk about um, so so a bit like myself so the reason I haven't bought a, a battery pack in the past yeah. is because it's too expensive essentially and I haven't got the sort of outlay up front so um, you know, obviously part of this scheme is about driving down that cost for, for residents via the sort of a bulk purchase of those. But some residents have been saying, well, even if it was reduced by, you know, 20% and it was a pretty good price, I don't know how I might then go on to finance that or, um, you know, should I approach, you know, a bank for a loan maybe and then, you know, they sort of work out the interest rates, maybe it's good, maybe it's not and, and it's that sort of part of, um, uh, you know, should I then go ahead with that, but, you know, does it make financial sense to, to go ahead with that and where do I get the loans from and that, so I just wanted to see how much support and help there was in terms of getting the finance for the the battery pack or the solar panels once the the price has sort of been given to the the resident thanks do you want to reply hi siobhan uh just a couple of points of information on the the, the numbers actually in that the original um scheme was set up 
uh, with the intention that it would around break, break even in terms of the commission um, that the council got and the outgoings in terms of marketing. And actually, the fact that it has turned um, quite a, quite a profit is a really good indication that the number of people who took this up was actually quite a lot higher than expected. Um, and the second point was just that in terms of this second year, um, a lot of those people who registered the first time may now have more confidence having sort of known people who've gone through the scheme. And so I think there's every reason to think that this second scheme will do well also. Can I just come back on that one before there's an answer to you, Graham, and then we go to Councillor Bridget Smith and then Councillor Jeff Harvey. Um, yes, I was, and so thanks for that as an indicator. That's kind of a proxy indicator on that one. So thank you, Siobhan. I'm wondering, um, should we be thinking what we do with that return um, in terms of, as a council, are we reinvesting? So, you know, it, it's really, really good. Um, and we know that, you know, as councils all around, we're sort of not getting as much government funding to provide public services. So we've got to think about that as well. So it, it's really important that it does come back into, um, you know, we've got a, a good return. But also, I think it's, is that something that we should think about how we can reinvest in, in further help to residents in this particular area, seeing as that's, that's why the money's come into us. I don't know if anybody else has a thought about that, but, um, you know, it, it's, it, and so I think it is an excellent indicator, obviously, if the original design was that it would break even, and we've actually come back with over £10,000, that does seem to suggest it's been a much higher final uptake of actually accepting um, than originally envisaged. So thank you for that, Siobhan. But to go to Councillor Graham Cohn's question about sort of support on advice around the finance, but also maybe support in terms of loans and things like that. Yes, this is this is something we could look into. I seem to remember um, that on the whole, what people can get from the bank is probably as good as anything that could be provided. But it's certainly something we need to look into, and we will do that. And can I? Sorry, sorry. Can I also add that? Yeah, um, I choose are quite receptive to sort of feedback like this, so we we can pass that on um, as something that would be really beneficial to those applying. So we'll pass on on that feedback to to I choose and um, yeah, the scheme. Thank you, and Councillor Bridget Smith. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I have to declare an interest that I've registered as well, despite living in a listed building in a conservation area. So it's, I'm going to be very interested to see uh, whether this gets through to uh, through to fruition. Um, so looking at the figures on page 54, it's really interesting how well you've, we've done in South Cambridgeshire, and uh, you know all credit all credit to you for uh, for doing this, um, particularly as you know excluding Cambridge City you know, we probably have way more challenges in terms of uh, listed buildings and conservation areas. So other areas which I don't think have the same level of challenge um, actually performed really quite poorly compared to us. So I think that's very reassuring. I would be interested, and I'm sure you don't know the answer, but I would be interested to know of those installations that have been successful, are any of them on listed buildings and in conservation areas? because I'd really like to know that we as a council are making some headway in breaking down these barriers um, to, you know, to allowing everybody to be able to benefit from, uh, from solar energy. Yes, I mean, um, so I, yeah, I completely agree. And I think that, um, yeah, I'm looking at the, the website now um, and they yeah they they provide some guidance on um, listed buildings but I completely agree that it's an area um, and I don't have yeah access to the to the figures on listed buildings in in um, specifically but I I would be able to to see if I can can get those and see see the um, yeah what what the challenges and what uh, have been on listed buildings and the lessons that we can take away from that um, and how we can yeah pass um, uh, learn from those um, and take them on for future future schemes as well so um, can I just come in before giving the, the floor to Councillor Jeff Harvey and actually this is an area that he's been championing um, as per the count the motion at full council um, Ellie so it would be really good if you did work with um, Jane Green and the team at Built Natural Environment 
and the conservation officers about this so that we've got, so that we're kind of seamless in a way, um, so that it's not seen as something different. And so we can really look at pushing the envelope ever more and more where it's possible and appropriate to do so um, and bringing in other expert, you know, where they've done this in other places. I think it's going to really help us to have the confidence. Um, and what we don't then have are two different responses going back to owners of listed buildings, which, you know, it wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't be helpful, especially if we're trying to make things easier and clearer for people to do things. <laughs> Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and I wonder if um, Councillor Fain is, is about to, um, and apologies for stealing his thunder of years, but I suppose yeah, it's also important to think about conservation areas, um, which sometimes include um, buildings that aren't listed, and um, sometimes that's an impediment, which seems sort of anachronistic now, um, given the urgency of um, climate change, need to address it. Um, so that's one point. Um, an easy question, really. I want to know whether the 380 tonnes is, is 380 tonnes per year or, or over the total lifetime of the panels. Um, I wondered about this year, whether we might find that um, people come back for a second go and therefore um, there are slightly more applications for battery storage than the, the people who got PVs last year are now thinking, well, I need to add some batteries. Um, actually, I have to admit that I was one of the dropouts in last year's scheme because I had sort of ticked an, an interest in batteries because I've already got solar panels. But I wondered, um, I haven't looked at the um, information for this year yet, but um, the reason I didn't go ahead was because um, I think PVs are quite a sort of simple proposition to sort of make some rough um, back of an envelope calculations on. But with batteries, um, when you start adding in things like uh, flexible tariffs, uh, time of use tariffs, uh, if you've got an EV, well, maybe arguably you don't need a battery because of the sun shining, you're charging your car, if you've got a heat pump, then you've got about four different variables there. It's totally mind boggling, um, you know, even for a, um, an engineer like me, but I don't know, um, and not a very good one maybe. But um, so it, it's really complex. And actually I learned from uh, Councillor Haling, so she found herself sitting opposite the world expert um, I was just about to mention uh, it. <laughs> optimum sizing of batteries, yes. So um, uh, and this was a sort of professor, um, you know, Cambridge University. So I think it, it isn't as simple as it seems. And I wondered if there could be some help coming through um, on answering those very complex questions, you know, and really answering the question, is it worth my while buying a battery? Yep, Councillor Paul Bypart. Um, yeah, I've also registered for the scheme um, and I'm looking to extend uh, solar panels that were installed 14 years ago to see if I can extend the scheme, for, uh, extend that further. Um, but I wanted to ask about um, efficiency of solar panels. They vary quite a lot. Um, obviously, if we're looking at the lowest cost provider, is there a minimum performance requirement? Um, because I think the best solar panels are now achieving 19% efficiency, but they're obviously more expensive than others. Um, is, there any, is there any performance requirements when selecting the provider? I don't, um, it certainly, I choose a, have always um, uh, uh, organised the scheme to be a high quality scheme with, with only the high quality um, panels on offer. And in fact, that's one of the things that they have learned as they have, um, as they've, they've developed as a company because they used to offer two different grades, but now it's only, it's only the high grade ones. Um. Yeah, good. Um, and I think it'd be very good. So I suppose I also don't declare an interest. So I signed up last year. Yeah. <laughs> And it was to see whether or not we get a battery. And it led to huge discussions in our house about whether, <laughs> whether we, and even when we got the, we did do the assessment, we paid the deposit. And in the end, we decided not to yet, as we were looking at the whole issues with, um, we haven't got a, an EV car yet, but when do we do? And, you know, when will it be affordable? And is that or not um, take place? But I think these are the kinds of conversations we want everyone to be having, you know? And so this is excellent because it provided us with a huge amount of information to come in. Not everything, but it enabled us to have those kind of conversations that we wouldn't have kind of been having. But also, um, Councillor Jeff Harvey just, um, and it was a disagreement because I wanted it and my husband did so. We've still got the conversation going on. But um, 
I did happen to sit next to, what day are we the week? Last week, I did sit next to, by chance, a self-declared world expert on um, the sizing of batteries and panels to particular establishments. And he has just um, published research that he's done on this. And he said, I've think of that. I'm a resident of South Cambridgeshire. Um, and I got the letter about solar together, he said. And I was wondering who I could talk to because he'd be very happy to talk to the company about, the, about what they're using to decide that and just to see if, you know, if they want to have access to his research and whether that would help in any way. So that's just a, a bye. <laughs> the kind of conversations we're having. Thank you so much for that um, report. It's really important that we have... Oh, Councillor Peter Fain. Thank you, Chair. I, I thought I'd perhaps um, ask a question as possibly the only member of the committee who doesn't have to declare an interest as currently installing solar. Um, I think in, in this area, we have a number of companies who are leading on solar integration, which I, uh, as Councillor Jeff Harvey referred earlier on, the importance of making solar something that can be considered in more, on more sensitive buildings and uh, indeed in conservation areas. And I, I just wondered whether um, that was an option that was looked at. It is inevitably rather more expensive, but on the other hand, it does tend to uh, look rather better and less intrusive on some buildings. Yes, yeah, it's not something that I choose or have offered, but again, it, it's very much a piece of feedback that we can give them. Good, thank you so much. So I think coming out of this session, thank you very much. It's really important to have seen, you know, we don't often get this, which is how did this, you know, how did an initiative go? It went very, very well. It's, you know, again, we're going to make sure that we've got as, as much publicity about it as possible until the 16th of March and get those registrations up. So there's just a couple of things. One, a decision about how that money that has come in in terms of the return on that, how that's used. I think that would be good to, to know um, the discussions about that and make sure that it's somehow reinvested, I think, would be our proposal from, from SIAC. Um, and some about the support around financing to make sure we've got that. And then the other area would be about listed buildings and conservation areas, whether or not um, we can have some kind of discussion together with the built natural environment team and looking at other providers, whether or not you signpost, you know, at least people if it doesn't work through the I Choose a scheme. So well done. Thanks so much for that. I'm looking forward to seeing the results from this year's um, scheme. Thank you. Thank you, members. So we're on to item number seven, which is the air quality update. And this is an update on the progress being made on our new air quality strategy. And Soraya um, Hashemi, hello, Soraya, nice to see you, who is our hello. scientific officer on air quality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Um, I just got to provide a quick update about our monitoring scheme at primary schools and also the upgrade of our air quality monitoring network. These are all in line with our new air quality strategy, which I'm very pleased to announce has been adopted in February. Uh, we have two additional uh, continuous monitors to add to our air quality network. One will be located in Norstow and one in Houston, hopefully this week as we speak. If all the groundwork's given and everything is going well, this will be in, uh, they will be installed and hopefully operational soon. Uh, this will um, facilitate to gather a baseline modern monitoring data for the new town in North Store as different phases are built and are in use. And we can keep a close eye on air quality along A10 in Houston. In addition to that, we have now three um, portable sensor monitors called Zephyrs that we are using uh, for our um, air quality monitoring monitoring scheme at uh, primary schools. Uh, we have completed a study in Camborne primary schools, uh, and I'm pleased to say that this was actually promoted on the National Clean, Clean, Air, Clean Air Day in June. 
and um, uh, it was well received uh, received by the school. We held um, a conversation as well about air quality, and the study was completed and was carried out between May and November. Uh, the results show that we are not nowhere near um, um, air quality objecti objectives in terms of um, nitrogen dioxide or particulate matters. What is interesting to see from the result is though um, there is a significant change uh, between the term time and half term when um, traffic is quieter perhaps. So. Uh, this is um, clearly shown in the data, uh, which is very interesting to actually see. We produce these reports and we put them on, on our website. Uh, the uh, three uh, monitors are now in place in Histon, North Stowe and Swayze. Uh, once these studies are completed, we provide another set of report to see how we're doing um, near those schools. And we have also set up a public portal to access data from these monitors. I have provided the links in, in the reports that you can see. Uh, once these are completed, we are hopefully looking to start different set of studies. So we welcome any suggestions if you have about any areas of concern. You can get in touch uh, via our air quality mailbox, which is always someone there from the team to provide assistant information or any updates. So that's from me. I'm happy to answer any questions if uh, if needed. Thank you very much. Sorry, it's really good finally, finally to sort of be talking about the results of the research of the monitoring matrix, that network of mobile air quality monitors outside schools and now going to be and fantastic. So outside those schools and showing results. Um, and I think that Camborne result would be very interesting. When we did the National Clean Air Day, um, we were interviewing the students outside who had just an assembly. And they were talking about the effects of idling, cars idling and drop-off points, you know, and wondering whether or not that would be picked up by the, by the air monitor. And so what's interesting is, you know, perhaps the Camborne schools taking that back in again, and it's reassuring to know that they're not crossing any thresholds. Um, but obviously, there is um, there is some pickup of difference that you can see, as you're saying, between term time and holiday. So I think it'd be very nice if we can follow up with the Camborne Primary School and feed back in that data. I'd be happy to do that as well, so that we can have another assembly or they can talk about you know those impacts because just that behavioural change of idling you know, outside schools is, is a huge thing, you know, that they can change as well as the traffic in, in general. So that's good. And it's very good to hear, obviously, about the, the three monitors and one of them in Histon, which I'm very pleased about, which is the new school, where there are perhaps some concerns about transport and traffic around there. So again, you know, really interesting for, um, for parents and families to know what's happening there. We've got Northstone, Swavesey. And, you know, it would be good to start setting up and preparing other schools so if you could say when that would end and perhaps we could have looking at what the next round of schools or other places that people could be asking um, about where we could. So the hypothesis was really around schools, wasn't it? But there were other areas that we wanted to look at that could be potential hotspots. So it'd be good to hear from you where we're thinking about. Um, I'm very, very happy that you're doing some benchmarking. So you're looking at before the build out, you know, in somewhere like North Stowe. That's, that's really, really important, especially as a healthy new town, huge amount of being done about that last mile. So having that benchmark, you know, to then look at okay, what's happening within those last miles within North Star, I think would be hugely important. So thank you, Sarah. I don't know if any others have got Councillor Paul Bear Park, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yeah, hello, Sarah. Um, I'm a member for um, Milton and Water Beach, so be aware of Water Beach and Newtown. Um, so phase one of the new town is being developed at the moment and the location of the primary school was a topic of great debate because it's quite close to the A10. Um, there was some modelling work that was done that suggested that actually the air pollution from the A10 wasn't going to be an issue. But I think it would be really good to validate that with some measurement um, so that, you know, if assuming it's, it's as per the modelling, that gives the 
you know, parents of children going to school confidence that it's not an issue. And if there is an issue, then there is time between now and when it's, um, you know, when children start, start at that school to put in some mitigation. Um, so, yeah, just a request for some monitoring at the Water Beach Newtown Primary School, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to say that we have picked up this issue during the committee planning committee for Water Beach and the school location. So we have a condition in that requires the developers to do some air quality monitoring. And I have uh, managed to convince the developer to actually go ahead and go beyond just the diffusion tube monitoring at the school location. Uh, and use these Zephyr monitors that we are picking up, the sensors, which will enable us to actually get proper data about particulate matters as well, which was the main concern at the planning committee. Uh, so I'm hoping to get the results in. We are recommending to at least have six months worth of data. That way we can actually, by annualization, see the likelihood of the uh, concentrations in the future. And this will hopefully um, answer the request uh, that you're proposing. Uh, I am also looking at Water Beach and Milton area for further um, uh, monitoring as part of new hotspots. Um, so in answer to cancelled hailings as well. So we are um, gathered, putting a list together and we we also we that's why we welcome any any suggestions for areas of concerns because uh, local residents they might know something and they have a concern and I do go around um, as a site visit just to see what's happening but the idea of having these Zephyr monitors which are portable they run on solar energy so we are not restricted in terms of how or where we can put them up enables us to actually expand our monitoring network and covering more and more areas rather than we could manage before. So I'm hoping to actually very soon get to those points as well. But the main thing to bear in mind is that we, at least by having six months worth of monitoring data, we can come up with a good understanding about the pollution levels. So that will might cause some gap between the studies and requests, but by putting this list together, uh, we're hoping to address them the all. Good, and thank you, Sir Ryan. As you know, I was very, very concerned about the um, the sighting initially of the of the Water Beach Primary School, so we did bring this up. And in the end, a lot of the assumptions around the methodology as you know, are around our current thresholds for the PM particulate matters mm -hmm. and whether or not at some future point we expect either those thresholds to change in line with the World um, Health Authority. So, and we're building for the future. So if there's concern at that level, um, mm -hmm. at the World Health Authority, they actually um, there shouldn't be a threshold that we should drive down as much as possible. There isn't a safe threshold for those particulate matters. You know, I think in the UK, we are starting to get government to realize that this is more and more important to consider changing our thresholds. So while we're doing big developments that are multi-year developments, but they depend on modeling on a certain threshold, because it didn't say there isn't, it just said it didn't cross the threshold. So that's county, you know, um, approved that as well, county council in terms of their environment um, committee. So all the way through the system, what we'd need to do is make sure that we can actually plan for the better well-being, I think, of everybody. So I think the monitoring, really important, just in case also there is any change with those thresholds um, in terms of national legislation. But thank you so much for doing that and making sure that, pushing for that and pushing beyond it as well, Soraya. So thank you very much. And I'm sure everybody in Water Beach will be very, very thankful for that as well, for your extra efforts there. That's what Jeff My pleasure. Harding. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yes, I, I was looking at um, the graph on page 91 of our agenda pack. Um, it shows some of the results for um, the Zephyr data um, yes. from May to November. So it's interesting that, um, well, I suppose you, you could sort of see there the effect of um, back to school, there's a bit of an uptick there, but in October to November, there's a kind of quite a rapid rise. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether that's due to not uh, motor traffic, but um, 
in, particularly in an oil village, um, central heating systems starting to work at a much higher rate. And, and certainly it's the case in my village that at the sort of time kids would be walking down our high street to school, I'm, I'm almost certain that the uh, majority of um, fossil fuel based pollutants will be coming from oil burning boilers, um, either um, sort of rogue ones that are not properly adjusted because boilers are outside of any regulatory framework like, you know, M MOT testing for motor vehicles. Um, we also have quite a lot of um, Arga burners, um, you know, um, oil-fired range cookers in South Cambridgeshire. Um, and those, because they're classified as cooking appliances, are completely outside of any regulation. In fact, if you ask Arga for any data, they say, well, we, we don't know what the thermal efficiency is, we don't know what the particulate output is, because um, we're not obliged to know that, because it's a cooking appliance. Um, I, I did occur to me that if we could find, if we could work with a county council um, and find a planned road closure that gave us enough run-in to get sort of pre-data, if you like, we might then actually get some, um, some, some scientific data on um, how much of this is background due to um, home heating and how much is associated with um, motor transport. Very interesting. <laughs> What did you say, <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Harvey. That is a very interesting point, and I'm, uh, it would make up a very, very nice study, I must be honest, but it will be very difficult to actually be able to draw that line and say by um, a phase monitoring uh, that we can specifically say what is allocated to what, especially with particulates, makes it very difficult because there are they're more prone and actually subject to local and regional um, effects um, anyway. But in terms of um, running a study to be able to understand uh, better about local um, air, um, air quality, especially villages who are dependent on oil or where we have um, lots of wood burning stoves in place, which I understand there is a lot of them around, although uh, DEFRA produces a lot of guidance about safe burning and um, to what type of wood and how actually um, do that to reduce the emissions, especially for particulates. Um, there are still so many old ones, as you mentioned. So that is another study we're hoping to look at to undertake, undertake, undertake next year when the season is actually back. Um, so you're saying looking at a comparison between villages yes. rather than a closed road and a non yeah okay yes yeah. In, in a way locally we would, would actually see if we can pick up um, any of the changes and the effects when they are actually active so uh, I welcome your comments and um, again any interest or suggestions about areas of concern particularly it would be welcome and very kind if you let us know. Thank you very much. And I think that that's that would be really, especially where we're kind of make, making this very specific to South Cambridgeshire, and this is a character of some of the villages. So I exactly. think that will be hugely um, interesting for many people. Thank you, Sarai. Um, and yes, thank you. I do have just one more question, which is a bit about the air quality strategy. And in that air quality strategy, when it was approved and adopted, we talked about alignment with city council. Yes. And I'd just like to ask a question that you bring back to committee at a, um, at a later date. We know that in terms of a just transition to climate change, which means fair for everybody, through the licensing committee and the licensing of taxis and their transition to um, low emission vehicles, mm -hmm. that both ourselves and city council have sort of reached a bit of a compromise to listening to taxi drivers and giving them a bit of leeway. They've come through the COVID pandemic, that's been really difficult. We acknowledge that it's actually quite difficult to get the cars at the moment because of, um, you know, the um, supply chain issues, which is causing a backlog in terms of being able to get the cars that they want to replace the, the diesel. But I did want to know that we are having good alignment. And so I would like, if possible, that you bring back one is having made those assumptions and being supportive what kinds of, sort of incentives or perverse incentives have we created just to sort of see the impact of those one, you know, one year on? 
into the sort of the time delay, the lag that we've given, and two, what impact has this had between South Cambridgeshire and City Council in terms of achieving the objective, which was those low emission zones within the city centre, and whether or not there's a perverse incentive of some of the taxis coming into South Cambridgeshire mm -hmm. to get licensed and therefore avoiding the, sort of the strictures in the city. So just making sure that we really are working for that alignment. If you could just bring us back um, a little report on that in a few months' time, that would be great. Sure, can do. Thank you. No worries. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. So we're now on to agenda item eight, which is the green investment update. And it's lovely to see you, Alex. Lovely to have you back with us and here at committee. So um, Alex Snelling Day is our green energy investment manager. And yes, for your update. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Halings. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we um, can. So, thank you. Uh, Greening South Cam's Hall is the first one on the on the list. Um, so obviously the, the kind of major bit of work was uh, kind of outside to do with the ground source heat pump. So the ground source heat pump, um, the kind of final boreholes have been done for that, um, along with all the backfilling of the trenches. Um, and then it moves on to the kind of solar carport and the EV charge points, which are, are back on top uh, of that um, in the car park. Um, inside the office building, uh, we've finished um, the kind of main LED programme and then the associated kind of electrical uh, works to do with the fire alarm system as well. Um, and moving on to the new building management system, which will also be put in to help us control um, kind of energy demand and use within the building. So the project is still scheduled for completion in quarter two of this year as well. Um, I'll move on to the next one and then obviously take any questions afterwards. Um, so moving on to the next project, so the Water Beach Renewable Energy Network. So that's the name that we're calling uh, the project at our Water Beach Depot. Um, the project purpose is to look at integrating kind of renewable energy from solar PV and also a storage solution around, around a possible battery. And this is to serve the fleet of electric refuge collection vehicles um, uh, as part of the Greater Cambridge Shared Waste uh, Depot. So... This part of this project is looking to secure funding from um, the combined authority. So we're working with them um, to, to kind of look at the project. Um, we've presented a kind of initial, um, uh, initial, initial document about the project, and we're waiting for some feedback on that from the combined authority. So the project team itself is comprised of colleagues uh, from Cambridge City Council and um, the Shared Waste Service and um, South Cam's colleagues. Um, and we're looking to work with a firm called Buigs, um, which we've procured through the uh, Cambridge Share Energy uh, Performance uh, Framework. And the next step will be to look at those detailed assessments, um, geotechnical testing and um, kind of forming a, a more detailed investment grade proposal to review. Um, and that will take uh, you know, a good few months before we would then be able to, to kind of get onto site um, early, early next year. And then lastly on the list of, of projects to update you on is the LED street lighting uh, project. So the upgrade is due to be completed um, probably in the next week or so, next couple of weeks, uh, mid-March. Um, and then the team are moving on to planning the second phase of the project. And this phase will look at the ornate lights, um, 88, I think, uh, uh, to be included in that um, second phase. Um, and that's began with a project plan um, and budget secured as well. And then the next step will be to look at the most appropriate contractor for, for those works. So current timescales, so these are dependent on um, the procurement process, um, but looking to have those practical works commence um, kind of middle of this year and um, to be early uh, completed in early next year. And some of the ornate uh, uh, lights have been identified as in poor condition, and so we are looking at how we can prioritise the upgrades of those via kind of existing maintenance contracts that we've got in place as well. So there are the updates for you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bridget Smith. Uh, hello, hello, Alex. Alex, lovely to see you back. Thank you. Um, so on the on Water Beach, um, it's going to be important, and you probably know this already, but it's going to be important 
to be able to demonstrate quite overtly that the investment from the combined authority there benefits more than just our council. And I think that's already the, the case. I think already we're, um, I think East Cam's uh, vehicles are already using the depot, aren't they? And, and county ones as well. So that's going to need to be quite explicit in order to um, make sure that the investment there is, is secure. And it's quite, quite right, you know, the combined authority doesn't have that much money. So, um, you know, any investments which benefit more than one council are, are particularly um, attractive. Thank you. New question? Councillor Jeff Martin. Um, yes. Um, oh, uh, welcome back, um, Alex. Um, we've, we've all missed you, so um, yeah, it's good to have you back. <laughs> um, I just um, had a, a few questions um, that have risen in my mind about the, this very exciting PV array. And I think, um, I think um, uh, either Bourdais or yourself is going to come back at some point um, to a future meeting and, and kind of give us some, some more details on this. Um, and I think that, that there was a little bit of um, confusion earlier on that, you know, in, in some way the PVs could um, entirely power the, um, the waste fleet um, and, and therefore um, avoid the need for a grid connection. But I think um, probably the grid connection will be needed uh, in any case, um, particularly sort of in overcast conditions um, during the winter months. Um, and I, I wondered um, actually, and I think I sent you a note um, earlier this morning that it, it might be um, good to incorporate the concept of, of um, not only using the electricity directly for the, um, the uh, electric um, waste collection vehicles, but also the possibility of um, sleeving it to, for example, you know, some of our other, other um, uh, housing or, or um, I mean, the, the economic zone we've just been talking about in North Stowe, um, so that we could um, directly use the electricity rather than storing it first and then using it to charge the waste fleet. And I just wondered if that had been thought about at all. Oh, shall I answer both those questions now? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, perfect. Um, so just going back to um, some points that Bridget made, I think, uh, yes, very much aware of the need to ensure that, you know, funding that went into this project would not just benefit kind of us as councils, but looking at other partners. So I know, like you say, there are other public sector partners that are based locally as well and making sure that it's, um, you know, there's an opportunity for them to use it as well. So and, and also exploring if there's any other opportunities to kind of, um, uh, yeah, kind of make sure that that value for money and benefit is is kind of wider as well. So yes, definitely taking that one on board. Um, onto your uh, points, Councillor Harvey. So um, I think we're going into a really exciting time where we are kind of testing the business case and, and kind of all aspects of the business case around that strategic case around carbon um, and also looking at the beneficiaries as well. So, um, you know, we will need to look at what our energy demands are from the vehicles as well and make sure that's properly modelled into there and matching it up with what the generation kind of modelling and profile looks like as well. So, um, yeah, I think there are options to look at how we use the energy in the most efficient way from both from finance, financial perspective, carbon perspective, um, you know, and also kind of supporting partners as well locally and, and economic um, uh, kind of perspective as well. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of options that are on the table around Kind of how we use that energy and who uses that energy as well so yes and um, i think the point that you made as well i'm um, happy to come back and give a bit more of a detail to go into a bit more detail around some of the kind of um kind of technical aspects of the proposed network or, or how it's how it's kind of being developed uh, to give you and the committee a bit more information on that so happy to do that thank you Thank you very much, Alex. And I was just wondering, while you're doing that whole business case, so as we're looking as well at the testing out, I think, of our you know, route map, so one of the councils that really does have a route map in terms of getting down to zero emissions, particularly for waste, the waste fleet, which is you know over 60% of our direct emissions, but also knowing that we're looking at what are the refuse funds and models you know, that are the right ones for... Um, rural, the rural areas within the district, which means that we may have to push back slightly, 
you know, what were our quite ambitious projections initially. Does, are you looking at how having the green clean energy, definitively that we're generating ourselves, that in some way helps to meet that um, in the round? Are we looking at that? Yeah, and I think it's probably worth saying as well, you know, there's, there's quite a few different projects or different kind of um, areas of activity and I'm making sure that I'm kind of linked into to kind of, um, you know, the fleet replacement plans and everything that's going on there so that we can kind of, you know, one one part of our business case helps kind of feed into another and vice versa. So, yeah, very much looking at that. It's, um, you know, yeah, part of a bigger picture around that fleet replacement piece that we're doing with City as well. So, yes. Yeah. Great. No, well, it's very, very good. We've always said that we should be looking out sort of for further funding, and so it's great to see that the council's managed to put in a successful bid for that, and it's actually, you know, fulfilling the next steps, which is great. So thank you very much. Don't think there are any other questions in terms of that. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. And um, Siobhan, yes, we're looking at agenda item nine, which is the forward plan and date of the next meeting. So anybody, if we do... We've got um, an update on the EV charging strategy, which is obviously of you know, great interest to, to all of us, and we've asked for that to be um, on the agenda, but also to providing guidance to parish councils on declaring climate change and what they can do on the back of that. Um, also coming out of the full council was also in terms of biodiversity as well, so we'd be including that in terms of guidance to parish councils too. Anybody else have any other issues that they'd like to see on the forward plan? our meetings. No, nope, not so far. There will also be the up, um, the regular update on the progress of the zero carbon and doubling nature action plan. And yes. I think the next meeting is uh, provisionally set for, no, for, for June, so uh, that will be at that meeting. Yes, good. And um, what we'll also feed back on. So, Siobhan, do you want to let everybody know that why we're going to London on, um, well, I'll be going with Eleanor on this Wednesday. Uh, yes, so we have been finalised for the IESC Public Transformation Awards in their Green Public Service category. Uh, so last year we put in an entry and we got a certificate of excellence. This year uh, we've we've gone up a notch. We're in the final. So uh, uh, good luck for Wednesday. We'll be there at the national awards, and we will see um, whether or not we get either gold, silver, or bronze. Which I don't think we'll necessarily get that, but the <laughs> finalist is pretty good anyway for the green transformation. So one, obviously, that's the quality of the. Um, the submission, so well done. <laughs> but it's also, you know, a commendation of all the work that everybody's been doing as well in, in that okay. transformation. So it's it'll be a huge, um, yeah, it will be very proud to be there and, think, and representing all of you. So it'll be one of the elected members, myself, and then as well, Eleanor, Eleanor in terms of staff, will be going there together. So that's great. Um, and the date of the next meeting, it's been proposed to be Tuesday, 21st of June, 2022. Um, if that's okay with everybody. Yep, good. Um, Aaron, thank you very much. Siobhan, you did mention something in an email that went around this morning. Do you just want to mention that briefly before we um, bit close this meeting? But yes, just to mention that um, at the last Grants Advisory Committee, uh, the committee looked at uh, proposals, slight changes to uh, the Zero Carbon Communities grant, um, grant Scheme. We're always trying to improve it on the basis of feedback, and so we have proposed some slight changes. SEAC uh, were invited along to that, that meeting. That's, we normally do it in that way, but um, the Grants Advisory Committee particularly wanted a, a clearer steer from SEAC um, on those proposals. And so um, if there are any questions around those or if you would like us to run through what those uh, proposals are, then we are very happy to do so. Um, it wasn't possible to put it on the formal agenda for this meeting and therefore um, it isn't a formal part of this meeting, uh, a decision. We're asking you to email or in other ways get in touch with Councillor Halings and um, and for her to provide a, a recommendation to Councillor Williams on SEAC's behalf. It would be by this Friday, yeah? Yes. Yes, by this Friday. So if anybody does have time to just stay um, on and you could just whistle through those or if anybody's got any questions about them, then then everyone's invited to, to do so. 
Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you very much. And um, Siobhan, Eleanor and Alex, thank you very much as well. I'll close the meeting.